Hello, ALC. Everybody has dessert, right? I'm going to have dessert to start with. I want to thank Kim for that. That's great. I'd like to be known more as a wayward anthropologist, but um, I think that the other introduction is probably more appropriate. Uh, so I've been anticipating this plenary for a year. Uh, as, a, as a researcher at heart, this is a little bit like Christmas. Bringing the two research projects we're going to be diving into for the next hour to you is truly, I think, something that we're all going to be thinking about for a long time to come. If you pay attention to the cadence of the plenaries over the next couple of days, you're going to be thinking maybe you went to church, right? Because it's going to be feeling a little bit like call and response. We want you to be hearing from inspiring leaders from all sectors who are really taking a stand in advancing solutions. Uh, like the ones we heard about this morning, like the leaders we heard from this morning. But just as importantly, we want to hear more directly from the inspiring families and individuals that motivate us all every day to choose these careers, to do this work, and to be in this room on a beautiful September afternoon in DC. So in service of that goal, we're kicking off this plenary by introducing and inviting Jeff Whittington to the stage. And Jeff uh, is the uh, executive producer uh, for KERA, Public Media in Dallas, Texas. I first met Jeff two years ago working with City Community Development and the Community Foundations of Texas, the Thompson Family Foundation, just a slew of partners to bring some local data to bear in the region around Dallas around the financial insecurity of households and to raise awareness about that. Uh, Jeff's work really was the part that got to that raising awareness piece because KERA produced a series that introduced the entire region to a set of families uh, that were experiencing asset poverty. So I'm going to ask Jeff to come on up, introduce a little bit of that, and we'll all learn and meet a few of these families as a way to start this off. Thank you, Ida. Good afternoon, everybody, or as we say, where I'm from, howdy. Uh, so last fall, KERA, the public television and radio station for North Texas, launched a six-month project called One Crisis Away. And our goal was to explain the asset poverty story, the issue, to an engaged and sophisticated, but also very busy and distracted, at times, audience. So how do we do it? Well, with the support of the Communities Foundation of Texas, the Thompson Family Foundation, the Allstate Foundation, the Dallas Women's Foundation, the Fort Worth Foundation and United Way of Metropolitan Dallas, as well as excellent data from the CFED Assets and Opportunities Scorecard, we were really surprised to learn that right in North Texas, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, 29% of the people that live there were living in asset poverty. So last summer, we held listening sessions with 30 organizations from all over North Texas people who deal with asset building and poverty issues every single day. We wanted to know what the, the stories were, we wanted to know what the issues they were facing were, but the key, and the key was always gonna be, storytelling. So we decided to follow some families, um, three families and one retiree. We followed them at home, at church, at work, and even at the doctor's office to find out what it was really like to live one crisis away. And so I'd like for you to meet three of them. Natalie Berquist knows what it means to be one crisis away, but she also knows what it feels like to fall over the edge. Natalie and her four-year-old son Samuel spent some time in transitional housing after a brief layoff in 2012. When we first met them, they'd moved into a Louisville apartment. Then, just last month, Natalie had to let that apartment go and move in with her brother after an unexpected new monthly bill arrived. We have a washer and dryer in here. And that's nice because I don't like going to the washeteria. It's like a lot with Samuel. And then we have one bedroom. This is Samuel's bedroom. So basically um, it's just a bed and then we have a little TV for Samuel. So all of a sudden everybody goes to this meeting and it's like the whole company, the president stands up or the company stands up and says, oh, we're letting you guys go. You're going to get a 30-day written letter uh, of notice, and uh, th the December 31st is your termination date. And thank you for your employment here, and don't ask for a severance. 
I ended up, you know, going staying in a hotel, and then I ended up going to a shelter, and um, it's called shared housing. Just the feeling of that. It's not my fault, you know, but it was like I was blaming me because I felt like I let my family down. So it was very, very tough. So basically, I live paycheck to paycheck. I'm working on having a savings account. If I did lose my job or if there was something, um, you know, I'm working on having a cushion basically to have like if something like that happened, I, I wouldn't be back in a shelter. I could still pay my bills for a month or two. What I thought was $200 a month out of my paycheck um, is initially $400. And because of that, I'm not able to continue staying in my apartment and re-sign my lease. So I am going to have to move out. At least my brother, uh, who lives in Dallas, he bought a home. He's um, offering us to um, stay there and um, pay rent for the room. So that's good. It doesn't work out, you know. You need help. Those people like myself who are working don't get it. You have to hope, you know, you have to dream, you have to know and believe that there is going to be something better and reach for it because if you don't have any dreams and hopes, you know, and you don't reach for something else, you're going to be staying in the same spot. You don't, you don't want to do that. To keep her head above water financially, 72 year old Shirley Martin has to be creative. She's retired from her 30-year career as a professional cook, but Social Security isn't enough. So she works a part-time job and rents rooms in her DeSoto home so she can pay her mortgage and take care of her bills. Saving money, she says, impossible. Okay, this can move. I'm doing the fresh baby carrots season with some chicken broth. I'm gonna steam them for a minute. Cooking has always been my thing doing parties and luncheons and, I mean, I, I just can't say enough about it. I just started on my own. I um, started at Hockaday School in 63, and I started at, out as a line server. So it came up that we needed a, a cook. So I wanted to tackle anything. I said, well, I want to take that head cook's position. I did. I've had a hard time. I've been in foreclosures, you know, and I've lost a lot and I gained a lot. If they weren't here, I wouldn't be able to make it. I mean, that's just simple as that. Yeah, it helps out a lot. It really does, you know. A lot of people ask me, how do you take strangers in your home? Well, I just have that faith in that. I know they need the help, and I just don't think about it. It's good. I like it. I love it, really. Good afternoon, Salvation Army. Shirley speaking. I can help you. It helps me with uh, my bills, my insurance, and things that I come short of with my Social Security, and food, of course, and gas. And it just helps me in so many different ways, it does. It isn't hard to relate to them, because I've been there in a different fashion. But when you're down, you're down, and you're out, you're out, and you always need some help, you know. And I can really relate to them. That's why I take it real hard. I can't put any money aside. All my money goes to every day, every month. You know, it's no saving. Uh, and if I do save, it's just like putting it up for a minute or two. But you know, when you stay focused on what you have to do and what you got to do, you will make it. You know, it might seem that you can't do it, but believe me, you will come up. Something would happen by the grace of God. Two years ago, Isaac and Elizabeth Madrid were leading a typical middle-class life. Two full-time jobs, a nice house in Rockwall, and a baby on the way. Then serious illness struck and everything changed. Isaac couldn't work, medical bills mounted, and Elizabeth had to shuttle between his hospital bed, a family member's home to drop off the baby, and her full-time administrative job. All my life, I've been pretty much healthy. I never really expected, you know, nothing too dramatic or um, life-changing, you know. Um, but as you know, um, as time progressed, it it turned into something more serious. Basically, what it is is 
a blood deficiency. Whenever you make blood, there's eight steps and he's missing one of the steps. You have all these dreams of, you know, you're pregnant and you're like, okay, well, once the baby comes, you know, we're gonna do this as a family, we're gonna do that. All these plans that you had are suddenly just not there anymore. And there's no way that you can do them by yourself because, you know, splitting up the time, it was sometimes being at the hospital, sometimes being with my baby. And I mean, I went days without seeing the baby. And I think that was, that was hard. My job tried to help me out as much as possible, but couldn't work. So my side of, of the income, you know, came to just a stop. Before everything started, we're, all of our bills depended on two incomes and that's how everything was planned and we were fine. And then all of a sudden, here you go, you don't have this one anymore. And it's kind of like, what do you do? I mean, go through the savings, which pretty much that's what we've done, but I guess you just gotta take it one day at a time. So just wanna applaud the, uh, the great work of, of my colleagues, Courtney Collins, who you saw on the screen there, uh, who reported the series, and Dane Walters, who produced the series. And that was pretty much the team that put this together. A um, Couple of updates. Uh, Isaac Madrid did have a second bone marrow transplant late last fall, but Sadly, his illness was too much for him to overcome, and he died in February of this year, the age of 25. His wife, Elizabeth, is still at her administrative job, is renting out their home now to make extra money, and she and now two-year-old Isaac have moved in with her family. Shirley Martin, our retiree, uh, she lost her job at the Salvation Army shortly after we reported that and took up a position as an in-home cook, which she loved to do, but now, She's working as a Walmart greeter, and she's retired, but she's working about 34 hours a week at Walmart, on her feet the entire time. But of course, Shirley's not complaining. Uh, her tenants have moved out, so now it's just her and her son, and she's applied for subsidized housing in hopes to move out of her current house and downsize to save some money. And Natalie Berquist and her son Samuel, who you saw at the top, have moved back into an apartment after a generous KERA listener sent her $5,000. Uh, Samuel was accepted into state-run insurance, so she doesn't have to pay for that coverage through her private work policy anymore. And one final note, we're really excited because KERA will revisit all of the families uh, this fall and report on how they're doing beginning in November. And starting in January, we're gonna roll out a focused One Crisis Away digital radio and television miniseries called The Cost of Living Poor. So thanks very much. I just want to thank Jeff again for that. Uh, and um, look, we, we, we all deal with real life and those family stories, uh, I think, are exactly the right grounding for the rest of the panel today. These snapshots um, of the families is, is what inspires all of our work, it what makes us come to work. The more we know about them, both their day-to-day -day financial lives and their dreams and aspirations, the better we can design solutions, policy solutions, product solutions, programmatic solutions that serve their needs. That desire to be responsive and to build the work on the bedrock of what's real for families, it's not new, but what is new in the last couple of years are things like that story set, but also really a proliferation of the kinds of research that's gonna give us a lot more to work with. I often say, and folks that I work with know, that I often talk about data when you try to get to the household level is like working with mittens on. You just can't get enough of a sense of what's going on in people's lives to feel like you can really develop a solution. The kinds of projects we're gonna hear about now help us move from mittens to pretty tactile leather gloves in a few ways in terms of how we start to help families. Um, so, I think with that, I'm just going to turn it around. I, th there's actually a lot more research than even what we're going to talk about today, and there's uh, work peppered throughout the entire ALC, the banking and color research that's just been done, uh, the new survey of household economic decision making by the Federal Reserve is exciting and useful information, all of the economic mobility research at Pew, the work that Brandeis has been doing tracking families, just a lot, a lot of information that gives us a more qualitative and quantitative set of information to work with. 
Um, but the two research initiatives that we're going to focus on that we do have on stage today, I I'm not trying to be Pollyannish with this, but my sense is that we're going to look, look back on both of these projects a decade from now and credit them not so much with shaping the direction of the field. I don't think it's about that. But I do think they're going to be two solid stakes in the ground, a stake both about what's real in financial lives of individual households, and also about the aspirations and ideals of what it means to live and have financial well-being in this country. So that space in between, where we need to go as a field, we're going to have some markers because of the research that you're going to hear about just now. Uh, so I'm going to begin with the end in mind in that sense, and uh, actually invite the entire panel to come up, sit up as I uh, come up on stage as I introduce uh, our first speaker. Uh, I'm reminded of the Cheshire Cat, and I think I'll take a lead from Alice in Wonderland, uh, because when Alice goes up to the Cheshire Cat and says, can you tell me which way I should go from here? The Cheshire Cat says, well, it depends an awful lot on where you want to get to. Um, and that decision, where do American consumers want to get to in terms of their financial goals, is in many ways the marching orders the CFPB got in Dodd-Frank as they began their work several years back. And so as a foundational part of their early research, they have been working hard to develop a consumer-driven definition of financial well-being. And it's been CFED's great pleasure, really a privilege, to be a partner in that work, uh, along with the Center for Financial Security and the Urban Institute and a great many other partners uh, these last couple of years. Uh, we've uh, been able to do that work uh, because of the leadership uh, of Gail Hillebrand and, and her division, and, and Genevieve Melford here is here as well. Uh, Gail is our first speaker, and she's an incredible voice and advocate, not only for consumer rights, but for ensuring that the voice of consumers is what drives and informs the work. And that's why she's the perfect lead of the CFPB's Director of Consumer Education and, and Engagement, uh, where she has been since the agency was started several years back. And in her decades of work prior to joining CFPB, she's been a tireless legal voice and advocate in the areas of consumer financial protection and community development. So I want to invite Gail Hillebrand up to introduce the Financial Wellbeing Measurement Project. Gail. Thank you, Ida. I'm delighted to be in this room with so many leaders in financial capability, asset building, and community development on the panel and in the room. Thank you for the work you do every day. The entire staff of the CFPB would fit quite comfortably in this room. And that means we're going to do our work in partnership with all of you, because you're spread out all over the country doing important work to help people make the most of their financial lives and their opportunities. I'm going to briefly tell you about the CFPB mission. Then I'm going to give you three short examples of how we listen to the voice of the consumer and of people like you who serve consumers in the programs and tools that we develop. Then I will turn to presenting the research. Um, some of you have worked with the CFPB, some of you have not yet done that. Our mission is to make markets for consumer financial products and services work for consumers, work for consumers, by making rules more effective, by consistently and fairly enforcing those rules, and by empowering consumers to take control of their economic lives. And we just saw in the videos how hard that can be. A lot of our work is on the supply side, writing rules, supervising institutions and providers, and bringing enforcement cases when that's needed. On the demand side of the market, we work in financial education, financial capability, and financial empowerment. And we're looking at how to help American consumers across the life cycle and all across the economic spectrum. As we think about listening to the voice of consumers in developing the services that we provide, the first way we listen to consumers is we take their complaints. And those complaints not only sometimes get help for individuals, but they also inform the work of our supervision and our enforcement. They, they can bring things to the fore, because you're going to see those problems way before we do. And problems are going to creep up in one part of the country. So if the people you serve are not complaining to the CFPB when they do have a significant financial problem with a service or provider, then they're not getting their fair share of our resources. So please send those folks to us at 855-411-CFPB or to our website at consumerfinance.gov. The second way we listen to consumers is when we design individual tools for consumers that you can see on the website. We use user-centered design and iterative testing. We do qualitative research to find out what people think about. 
and where people who do well think about what they think about, and then we really test that out with consumers to see if it's a tool they will use. You can see a good example of that at Paying for College on our website, and we're now developing one to get people to comparison shop for the home loan, and you'll see that uh, in the coming year, owning a home. Finally, we work a lot with intermediaries like you, and the last thing we want to do is say, we're from Washington, here's a program, and good luck with that. We're not a grant-making agency, so we can't pay for it, but instead what we do is work with people in the field to find out what it is they need from us, and then really test it to see if it's going to work. We have a program, there's a panel on it later uh, in the session, somewhere, somewhere in the program, called Your Money, Your Goals. It's a toolkit for anyone who's providing social services work, so that those individual frontline social service case managers can pull that off the shelf and say to the person, well, you're just coming in one time, let me tell you about the EITC. You're coming in for job training, let's talk about pulling your credit report before you get that job to make sure it's not going to be a barrier. And we tested that in 21 states with 1,400 social workers. And then they used it with their clients. And in three months and six months, we asked them, is it working? What should be different? They told us to make it shorter, and we're working on that. And they gave us some other invaluable advice. And you can see the Your Money, Your Goals at the exhibit table uh, right by the escalator. So now I'm going to talk about the research that's been referenced. We wanted to find out what the answers were to some tough questions. What does financial success look like? What do we have to do to help consumers really create in their own lives financial well-being? What do we want people to have in addition to a sufficient income? Many of you work in income and asset building. That's incredibly important. But in addition to income sufficiency, what else do people need? That's the question we wanted to ask. And most importantly, what do people have to know, do, and be supported in in order to, to achieve financial well-being and keep it over their life cycle? So we uh, started with the literature. We looked at what was already known. And guess what? The literature didn't answer this question. So we then engaged with a fabulous set of contractors to interview consumers all over the country. These were wide-ranging, open-ended interviews. We have 1,600 pages of transcripts, both from consumers and from credit counselors, financial professionals of various types. And people talked about what they wanted in their financial lives. We focused in on financial well-being. That's not an original idea. Both the US National Strategy for Financial Literacy and the OECD have identified financial well-being as kind of the, the goal of all the work in financial literacy and capability. But no one had defined what financial well-being is in financial literacy or financial capability. So we set out to try to define it and to identify things that would contribute to actually creating it for more people who live here in America. First. We're developing a definition of what is financial well-being. Second, we're getting insights from the research about how you create it. What's that combination of skills, attitudes, knowledge, and, and supports that will make a difference for people in achieving and maintaining financial well-being? And the third phase of the research comes next year, and that is we're developing a scale to identify how do you really measure the subparts of financial well-being? And we'll be sharing that with the field. We hope it could become a common yardstick that anyone who is trying to help people get ahead in their economic lives could look at to see, is our program delivering against these goals? And we expect to it to shape the work that we do at CFPB as well. So we think the outcomes of this work are going to allow us to better understand how to design and measure the effects of financial literacy and capability programs. It's going to allow all of us to understand how we can even better support consumers as they work toward their own financial goals. So the first question, what is financial well-being? We talked to a lot of individuals, and we focused on developing a definition of financial well-being based on what people told us made them happy in their financial lives. Those were doing well, what did they have? So these qualitative interviews gave us a first-of-the-kind definition on financial well-being. And People had a lot of different visions about what's a good life, what's a good, good life financially, but a couple of things came through loud and clear. People consistently told us security and freedom of choice were the contributors. That's what they wanted in their financial lives, security now and security in the future, and enough room in their financial lives to make a choice. And these were deeply personal choices. Some people wanted to quit their jobs or go back to school. Some people just wanted to feel that they had room to be generous with family and friends. Some just wanted to take the kids out to dinner once a month. 
But those, those deeply personal things are the things that are going to help motivate the people who we're all trying to serve to you know, do the hard day-to-day -day stuff of sticking to a plan or a budget or making those trade-offs one, one day and one moment at a time. So our current working definition of financial well-being has four pieces. First, having control over day-to-day -day and month-to-month -month finances. Second, having the capability to absorb a financial shock. And you, you heard, I think, in one of these videos what happens when people can't absorb that shock. Being on track to meet financial goals. And the fourth one is having that financial freedom to make choices that allow someone to enjoy life. Uh, I've told you we're working on the scale. That'll be for next year. But we do have some, some insights now from the research and the interviews about what contributes to this financial well-being. And uh, I'm not supposed to say findings, but promising implications, because we're going to do more testing in this area. But the research showed us the importance of asking questions, not so much to obtain a particular fact, but the skill of asking questions, what you might call financial research. There's a lot of information out, of there, out there. Some of it's not very good. Some of it is excellent. And we found that people need that skill and practice in asking questions, finding answers, and then applying what those answers mean to their own lives. And any of you who've worked in financial coaching know it's about people finding the answer for themselves and not somebody telling them what to do. So we found that being able to get information and evaluate it was critically important. We also found out what lots of you already know, knowledge is not enough. It wasn't enough to be able to get the facts. People need to be able to build a plan for themselves based on that knowledge and their own circumstances. And finally, we found that people need to be able to act on those plans day in and day out, making the small trade-offs that will add up to a big difference over time. So research and critical thinking skills were fundamentally important, but they weren't the only thing. Uh, the ability to make good decisions also, we found, stems from non-cognitive skills like focus, discipline, and perseverance. And it can be very hard to persevere when you have these bumps and shocks coming up in your economic life. We also found that attitudes really matter. Uh, time orientation between now and later, people who are able to think about the future in one part of their lives told us they were happier and more satisfied with the financial aspects of their lives. And self-efficacy, that belief that if I take a step, it will make a difference in my life and the life of my family was also important. We found that social context matters and that people told us that their financial norms, their expectations, their conduct, was deeply dependent on what they got from their parents, from their mentors, from their caregivers. We didn't ask about peers or we didn't get the answer about peers. I know there's also a discussion about financial peers and how to make that more valuable. So fundamentally, we found that the skill is not just knowing how to do things. It's not just deciding what to do. It's that skill of practicing, getting information, practicing evaluating information, practicing using information, and it all, what you see in your family also matters. So that means every one of you that's working with adults is going to have a real impact on that generation of kids that comes along. And every one of you that's working with kids is laying a huge foundation for financial success for those people throughout their whole lives. So here's a summary of what we learned so far, and then I'll close. Um, financial well-being is having both a sense of security in your ability to meet your needs and obligations and the financial freedom to make the choices that will allow you to enjoy your life. It seems to help people to have more financial well-being when they ask, when they plan, and when they act, coupled with a very strong habit or tendency to think about their means and live within them. And I want to pause here and just say, income sufficiency matters in America. Wealth matters in America. We do not think that, that this work is going to replace the need for all the work that's being done in that. But this is complementary to the income sufficiency work. This is talking about how to help people get the most out of what they do have, even as many of you are working passionately on distribution of income in America. So as a nation, we have a real challenge to move the financial education and literacy conversation away from, here's some information and good luck with that, over to the harder space that will be more effective. What kind of supports do people need? to make these tough choices and trade-offs in their lives and to stick to them so that they get good results over the life cycle. That's the challenge we're taking up at the Bureau. We're going to do it in partnership, I hope, with every single one of you. And I look forward to the work we'll do together. Thank you. Thanks, Gail. 
And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you all another foundation research project that's the first of its kind in the United States, funded by the City Foundation and the Ford Foundation. The Financial Diaries project is going to shift the ground under us, I really think so, in terms of what we know about the daily complexity of the financial lives of American households. It's going to anchor us in what's real, even as we aspire to figure out how to help pe move people forward toward their own goals. Uh, it's an ambitious and bold initiative, and here to actually tell you about it uh, are its two principal investigators, uh, and I'm just thrilled we have both of them here, Rachel Schneider and Jonathan Murdoch. Rachel Schneider is the Senior Vice President of Insights and Analytics at the Center for Financial Service Innovation, uh, CFSI. I think that most of you know CFSI. I know CFED couldn't do its work without CFSI doing its work, so they're a long-term partner, and Rachel's a dear colleague. Uh, and a damn good researcher, as her uh, colleague and principal, co principal investigator said just a little while ago. Uh, Jonathan Murdoch is professor of public policy and economics at New York, uh, New York University Wagner School of Public Service. He's also the executive director of the Financial Access Initiative. Um, and uh, as they'll tell you, this, this work was inspired by work that happened overseas that led to a book called Portfolios of the Poor. Uh, so let me welcome Rachel and Jonathan to share more with you about the Financial Diaries Project. And let me ask Brandy McHale to come up as well and take a seat. So I'm going to switch hats. Since CFP, CFED has partnered with CFPB on the financial well-being work, uh, and for the rest of the panel, I'll be joining Gail to talk about that, that work. Uh, and Brandy McHale, who is CFED's vice chair of our board, uh, she also moonlights as chief operating officer for the City Foundation. So she can wear both hats as she leads the discussion after we hear from Rachel and Jonathan. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, it was exciting to hear Gail's remarks. There are so many um, points of connection. We want to describe a project that we are really in the middle of, and we hope to be able to share lots of new insights over the coming year. The US Financial Diaries Project, um, as Ida was saying, is a collaborative um, project between NYU and CFSI. And I really want to also acknowledge our funders. Uh, the Ford Foundation and the City Foundation are not just um, generous in their support, but also have been an important sounding board, an important partner, as we've thought about how to use research effectively to make a difference that's practically relevant and not just academically relevant. We also um, uh, appreciate support from the Omidyar Network. So why are we doing this? What's the challenge? What makes this research new? We started with this basic problem, which is that we're all trying to work on improving the economic and financial lives of Americans across the country. And we often look to data um, that's available, but much of that data isn't quite right. It might be a one-off survey that captures some element of people's lives or an annual survey. But the truth is that we all live our lives day to day, week to week, season to season. And to really capture those ups and downs and navigations throughout the year, we realized that we needed a different approach. And so we created this project we call the US Financial Diaries, which is a repeat survey of households, trying to capture every dollar that households spend, earn, borrow, save, share with friends and relatives over the course of a year. The households were met every two to four weeks. Um, they developed close relationships with researchers with the idea that as we built trust and kept on um, repeating the conversation, we would start to see activities, behaviors, um, challenges, opportunities that are often very hard to see. The project um, is taking place across the country. We're in California, Mississippi, uh, Ohio and Kentucky and in New York City. We're working in 10 different sites. We have about a third of our um, sample below the poverty line. A third is just above the poverty line. And another third is moving into the middle class. So this opportunity has really given us a chance to build on what has been achieved by many people in this room, which is to move a national conversation from just thinking about income to really thinking about assets. And we're, with this project, hoping to build on that conversation 
by adding cash flows into the mix. The real focus here is on cash flows. We've collected about 300,000 different cash flows, income, saving, borrowing, et cetera, as I said. About 460,000 questions on other parts of people's lives. Health, tax time, financial literacy, some of the things that um, Gail was just describing. We follow people's ups and downs at work, in love, in health, um, all the kinds of things that make us real people trying to maneuver through life. And Rachel's going to take it from here and describe one of our households, um, Ricardo and Daniela Garza. Thanks, Jonathan. So um, in, your, in your bag from um, joining the conference, you all got this postcard. Um, and what I'm going to point out is that this, this line here, it says, it says, what does this look like to you? And the idea is to show you how much volatility there really is in people's incomes. So this is the income picture over the course of the year that we knew them for a family who we've called the Garzas. And Daniela and Ricardo Garza um, have a three-month-old daughter, and they're in their mid-20s. They live in California. And they have, as you can see, considerable variation in their income. They have four primary income streams. Ricardo has a, what we term a regular job. He earns $400 a week, every week consistently, from working construction. He also works on the side, um, helping a friend with his construction business. And that sometimes generates um, a few hundred dollars a month. Sometimes it generates a 1000 um, In the meantime, Daniela earns money from doing childcare. She also sells various goods, um, flowers, or gift items. And her income uh, varies between zero or at the highest time point we ever saw, um, she made $1,700 in one month. So as a result, um, their median monthly income um, covers expenses for the most part, right? They earn, on average, $2,800 a month, and they're able to keep their expenses, on average, around $2,500 a month. But if you look at this swing here, right, the lowest month that we saw was $1,600, and the highest was $5,000. So over time, they have to be able to figure out how to smooth that out for themselves, and that introduces several challenges for them. Um, we see them over the course of the year turning to pawn shops, other kinds of costly loans. They rely extensively on an overdraft um, line that they have at their bank. Um, and so they're, and they're very creative with their own cash flow management strategies, right? What bills to pay when, um, how to um, buy goods and then sell them in a way that ma maximizes their cash flow over time. Um, and what we see with the Garzas is very typical of what we see in the households overall. And as a result, you see people racking up significant amounts of debt. So 78% of the, of the people who have credit cards in our sample, 78% of those are not paid in full every month. 34% um, have a card that's at its maximum debt load. And um, almost all of the households, 97%, have at least one month during the time in which we knew them in which spending exceeds income. So what we think this shows is how important it is to think about um, not only the constant juggling that households are doing about what they need for the future versus what they need today, but to really think in three time zones. It's about now, soon, and later. And when you look at um, sort of the low amount of savings for the long term that households have accumulated, it's tempting, and we often find ourselves um, thinking about how to help households postpone spending today in order to have enough for later. Um, what we're seeing, really, is that households are saving, and they're saving often for soon. They're thinking about next month, two months from now, six months from now. Um, and so we um, think that it's crucial to be thinking about all three of the time horizons that families are concerned about over time. So as we start to think then about um, product innovations, policy innovations, programmatic innovations, it raises a lot of issues. One of the great lessons from the asset building experience and the American Dream demonstration of IDAs has been that households are looking for structured ways to um, save for the future, but also need some flexibility for the short term, as um, Rachel was saying. Figuring out how to provide that kind of flexibility while providing that structure is a difficult task. And we see our households trying to balance those two 
sort of competing and contradictory objectives um, in various ways. I think we'll have a chance to talk more about it um, in the discussion. But again and again, we see the problems of households dealing with hard problems that are fundamentally at odds and yet coming up with some um, fairly innovative and successful solutions. Today, we've just launched a new website, um, usfinancialdiaries.org. As I said, we're just uh, beginning to write and release um, different reports and writing. So um, if you come back, um, please check us out over the year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have a preciously short amount of time. So let me try to orchestrate this a little bit. Um, there are two mics on either side here. I'm going to ask people that if you have a question, that you actually come up now and come stand at the mic. Um, I'm going to kick us off in just one moment. Here's the ground rule. It has to really be a question. <laughs> okay. I'm, they sent me up here because I'm fearless. If we cut you off, it's like being at the Emmy Awards or the Oscars. Take no offense. We love you, we adore you, but we have a limited amount of time. Um, and don't be shy. Come up to the mic. We, we really want to ha have a chance for some discussion. So let's just jump in. Let's say what I think is really interesting about this work is that I bet you that there is not a single person in this room who doesn't actually instinctively know all the things that you're learning, Yes. right? You could probably name and tell the same stories. You have families that you see every single day. But what I think is really different about this kind of research is that one, we're gonna really work hard, and I know there are other similar projects, to really begin to humanize this issue. And I think about this kind of research around winning hearts and minds. We're going to humanize it, we're going to win people's hearts, and we want to create a groundswell of support around these issues and solutions that work. And second, we want to win the minds of policymakers and, more importantly, critics who are out there by having really solid data. So let me start off by asking any of the panelists who want to jump in and be the first, kind of what's been the biggest surprise for you? And in terms of thinking about this idea that this work is going to be used to win hearts and minds, what has really popped up that um, you may have suspected or thought, but now you really know, or something that challenged your previous assumptions? Go ahead. Um, well, this is something that Jeff's um, video just showed beautifully. Those ups and downs that um, Rachel was talking about, just how much they're, um, they play out in everybody's lives, really across our sample, and how much they then shape um, financial decision-making intentions. That was surprising because we don't have that kind of data, haven't had it until now, um, and to see it play out so clearly um, was really eye-opening. Yeah, right. yeah, I'd add to that and say, um, this is certainly a point, as you described, Brandy, where I'll say this and you'll be like, yes, we knew that instinctively, but to be able to then see it play out in the data, I think is really important, is that money is emotional and money is about interconnection and that very few of the households that we're talking with manage their finances alone. For the most part, they're intertwined with family and friends and the rest of their community in ways that drive their financial decisions, um, but also, um, right, or what bring meaning and joy to their lives and purpose. And so if we really want to be able to help people manage their finances, it's, we're going to have to be able to connect it to the other things in their lives as well. I'd like to agree with that. I think that this idea that money is not about math, we have to get over that as a country. People can do very well in making trade-offs and choices without, when putting the math on one side. So we have to get over that. In our research, I think the surprising, maybe it was intuitive, but we didn't see it until consumers told us, is the surprising thing was the freedom of choice. And it doesn't mean you have to be over a certain income number. It's right. about the flexibility you have or don't have in your life based on what your financial status is. So I think that was important. The other thing is really confirming the intuition that we had. Family matters. Youth matters, and that means if people are not getting it at home, we have to think about those kids. Are we going to help teachers give it to them at school? Are we going to help community centers provide that? Are we going to have financial mentoring for kids? How are we going to solve this issue as a country so we don't leave the next generation behind? And from your work, I thought one of the most powerful things was this idea that it's actually much harder to manage your money 
if you are at the bottom. If you don't have a regular paycheck, you've got to manage the income side and the expense side. Lots of us just have to manage the expense sides. I think that's going to be powerful in the discussion. Yeah. And I think the only thing I'd add to the surprise in some ways is just um, there was a, more of a willingness than I think we ex expected for people to talk about nuances of their financial lives. We have it in mind that it's a taboo subject in this country. We don't think that it's the kind of thing you want to bring up. But in fact, people were willing to share what they knew, what they wish they'd done differently, what they'd like to do in the future. They were, they were really wanting to talk. It was hard to keep on track with schedules. Uh, and so I think that we need to tap into that a little bit more. I think that there's more of the story to tell. I think that there's more powerful ways to tell it. And I think that uh, there's uh, a groundswell of ways that those voices themselves can lead to the kind of demand for solutions, both in the policy and product space, in ways that we haven't really thought about. Yeah, I'd love to build on that. Because I, you know, we started out um, and talked a lot about how are we going to keep families in. What we asked families to do was incredibly onerous, right? Talk to a person in, talk in person um, several times right, every few weeks over the course of a year and tell them everything. We assumed we were going to have a lot of attrition. And to be clear, we did, right? People moved or something happened in their life that made this not work for them anymore. Really, the reason people kept talking was that they wanted to be heard. And I think money in our society is very taboo. People, for the most part, don't talk about their finances. And that, I think, is an inhibitor to improvement in all of our finances. We consider it private, family, close friends. But I think really um, sustained societal level improvements in our financial well-being or financial health have to be accompanied by people talking about these issues much more freely um, so that they can generate the information and support that they need. So this morning, um, when Michael Sheridan spoke, he actually you know, said, um, as humans, you know, managing money, we may not actually do it that well. We may not be wired to really do it. Let me actually ask you, through the work that you've, you've done, do you agree? Do you disagree? Have you found people doing it well or, or things that, um, having coping mechanisms that actually surprised you? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, one of the things that we often say is that everybody has a system, and the question is whether that system is really working as effectively as possible. But really, everybody has a system. And one of the things we see which comes up again and again is the way that money gets sort of social meaning attached to it. Money gets earmarked. So the money I'm earning from babysitting is going to go to this cause, and the money I earn at the job is going to that cause. That, those devices are often very powerful, but we don't really have a way to um, think about them in terms of products and policies. Um, we're starting to think about mental accounts and labeling mm -hmm. savings devices, et cetera. But one of the things which has surprised me is how important this kind of earmarking is um, and how it could enrich the conversation. Yeah, I, I also would add to that and say, um, I think it's true that in some fundamental way we're not equipped to deal with money in the structures that have been provided necessarily. But over and over, we were impressed by the resourcefulness and savvy of households in managing what looks like impossible or it's certainly difficult situations, right? So people who have workarounds for what are structures that don't quite work for them. And thinking of somebody in Brooklyn we talked to who is using his mother as uh, his savings account. And his reason for doing so is if it were in a bank, he'd be able to get it whenever he needs it. He wanted a little bit more pressure, <laughs> right? <laughs> but he knew his mother would apply exactly the right amount of pressure. If he really needed it, he'd get it, right? But she'd have the right judgment. So like some of it is about, so this is a case where somebody's setting up for themselves the right structure, right? And it didn't exist already in the formal situ systems that were available to him. I think, oh, go ahead. We also find that consumers blame themselves for whatever the financial issue is. We get consumer complaints and people often say, I thought I was the only one, or my neighbor told me about CFPB, or they'll say, I wish I hadn't made this mistake. I'm going to use that word mistake. And it might be something they were actually marketed into, affinity fraud, solicited into, um, elder abuse stolen from. But they all think, if only I knew more, it would have been different. And I think as we open a national conversation about money, we have to acknowledge it's hard, but also acknowledge that you have something to bring to the table wherever you are in your financial life. You know, you can talk to your kids about how to do things well. You can talk to your kids about things that you would do differently if you were doing it again. 
Um, you know, if you're a smoker, you can still tell your kids, I really wish I'd never started. Yeah. And I think it's re just really hard for all of us to see that there's a value we can add to this conversation. And part of what we want to do is take the shame away from money, admit that it's hard, and then start to encourage people to talk about it to each other in their peer groups, in their families, with the older generation and with the younger generation. And I think the thing that I would add is that, that we need to thread the needle carefully because even as we need more insights about consumer judgment and their ability to make decisions, going back again to Michael Shradden and to I think the work that a lot of us are on here, uh, even if you are optimizing how you're spending your dollars at the, at the edge because you're living paycheck to paycheck, there are systems that are working to make this completely easy for certain people in this country and mm -hmm. systems that are working to make it really difficult for a lot of folks. So it's not really just about the individual behavior. And there's an entire, even as we become consumer centric and humanize the work, it's very important to look just as rigorously at the systems that create barriers uh, to people even when they are optimizing their decision making. So. <laughs> So I will say that there are a couple of sessions that are coming up uh, over the next couple days where you can get more in-depth information about each of the studies. And I know there are some people that may have questions about methodology, and there'll be a chance to dig in more. But one of the things that I, I think is really interesting about this work is that the goal is not to finish the work. I, I know we tend to think, right, that that's the finish line, to produce it, to present it, but it's really to make it actionable. So can you talk a little bit about how you think some of this work will be, will be moving from dialogue to action? And I'd be particularly interested to see your thoughts about how um, this group can really leverage this. And then I think one of the things that we're all driving towards is how are we going to really use this to influence policy? That's a big question. And then I'm going to get to the audience. So I see one person. If there are other people, come on up. I think we're going to influence policy in part by admitting that it actually costs money and you have to provide real in-person, high-touch support to people to help them build financial capability and skills. It's not going to be a web app. I mean, all these things matter. Having web tools is helpful. Coming to the CFPB for answers is helpful. But it's that face-to-face, in-community infrastructure and support. And we should admit that it's expensive and it's worth doing because it's going to save people so much grief and heartache and give us so much more time for people to be economically productive as they get this service. But we have to stop pretending that it's a flyer and a brochure and a website and you're done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think um, absolutely true. I also think it's about shifting the dialogue in both the policy community and among those of us trying to do this work um, towards the outcome, right? So the financial well-being work that CFPB do is doing is incredibly important. At CFSI, we're um, thinking about our work now in terms of what financial health outcomes can be achieved. We've spent a decade, rightly so, thinking about how to improve the quality of financial services that exist and thinking about what it means for people to be underserved. The reality is that that's still an in-between. For somebody to get better service is still an in-between. The outcome, it's still a how you get there. Right? The actual outcome we seek is that people are better off. Right. And um, CFPB's definition, um, I think, is very powerful. I think coming to indicators about what, how you'd measure that is very powerful. We've started talking about it um, in terms of really a very similar way. Um, ensuring that people have the ability to manage day to day, to have resilience in the face of ups and downs, to take advantage of opportunity over a longer term. We need to be able to stay focused on that as the outcome. And that's very difficult when you're immersed in the day to day delivery of service. Um, I think I have a typical academic um, response here to the question about um, practical implications. I think there's incredible practical power in having the data to say, you know, this really is what Americans today are facing. Yeah. It doesn't look like we thought it did exactly, or it does, but now I can show you in a new way um, to try to convince you of a, an argument. I think merely showing sort of the ups and downs, the obstacles, and households' own solutions, what they're making a priority, um, has incredible practical implications. The, the other thing um, which we're going to be looking at in the next um, few months is you know, issues around financial literacy is here we have a chance to look at 
a whole array of different choices that households are making. Are they paying bills on time? Which bills are they paying and not paying? Um, a whole series of economic choices which usually are under the radar screen. And we can get a richer sense then of how that connects to the typical ways that we think about financial literacy and whether we might be able to expand um, those notions based on what households themselves are accomplishing. Great, thank you. For, really quickly, I think for me, the most practical, even in, in the financial diaries aspect, the most practical thing is I could actually imagine now how do you jumpstart conversations? We, we talk about the platforms for prosperity here. There's education. For folks spend their lives reforming education mm -hmm. or workforce development or any of those things. The stories of people's lives are what everybody can get around, know how they touch that family, and try to start figuring out how they work together uh, to that shared outcome. And so I think that the richness of the data and the scenarios, I can imagine that using that to fuel a very grounded conversation uh, between decision makers and uh, program operators who maybe haven't worked together before. And so I'm excited about applying it in that way. And I think similarly, um, the idea that the next phase of the work is coming up with an actual scale where you could ideally know, you know and measure how, you know, what is the risk that folks are facing in terms of their financial life and, and, and what is the level of intensity you must apply at a certain point in time. We certainly know that in the physical health space. We don't have any of the right metrics yet in the financial health space. So I look forward to the future of that as well as a very practical next step. Great. Okay, Ellen, you're up. <laughs> Thank you. I, we do have to admit this was a bit of a plant, <laughs> just in case nobody else started. So um, some of the most um, uh, vivid pieces of the diaries work have been um, uh, volatility in income, which you talked about, but also expenses, the household, household size and composition um, changing wildly over the course of the year. And then um, the, the whole idea of communal money, which Rachel briefly mentioned. How does this um, dovetail with a series of policies that we make in Washington, which talk about um, eligibility based on annual income? or underwriting based on debt to income ratio. How, how should we start thinking about it knowing that this volatility is out there? Uh, for, for not doing the diaries, I'd say that that's a great follow on to what would be the kind of conversations you'd wanna use the diaries data to help fuel. How does that kind of volatility and seeing that on paper for so many households that you know that that's the norm and not the exception, mm -hmm. uh, how does that help uh, program operators rethink eligibility, rethink mm -hmm. the cycles with which they base that thing? It's not a small challenge, right? But how, how do you use that to even get a, a wedge into that conversation? Mm -hmm. That would be my sense of starting point. So I'm going to ask for one other yeah, that's fair. comment. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that is, those two examples that you gave, Ellen, I think are the two hardest, right? Because if what we've done is showing that it's actually really complicated to figure out if somebody's below the poverty level, um, you still have to come up with proxies that will work in the real world, more fast-paced policy environment or product innovation um, world, right? So I, mean, I think that this work shows that our underwriting, for the most part, is pretty insufficient. But there's still now a whole set of work to figure out how you could do better underwriting without going back to the idea of now I'm going to actually go with a pencil and paper and find out every single thing about you before I give you a loan. Right? Because we know that's not viable today. So I think there is a, a lot more work to do um, to figure those, those questions out. Thank you. All right, let's go to this side of the room. Thank you very much. Um, it's a very provocative report that you're doing and potentially subversive, I think. <laughs> In, it would be you, not me. In, <laughs> no, you too, probably. In, in talking about Ricardo's household, I heard my own household there. Mm -hmm. My fiance and I have an income that is only a few hundred dollars above that, if that. We have, between us, maybe 40 years education, another 40 <laughs> odd years of work experience. I identify myself as poor. Um, what are the implications from your research, do you think, in terms of class identity, um, the shifting political, social, and cultural roles of class as a consequence of the decline 
an increasingly unapproachable uh, aspect of the American dream? This is where it's really hard to be moderator because I really want to answer that, but, <laughs> but we only have a moment, so I'm going to ask one of our panelists to, to take a stab. Go I'll jump, I mean, one of the interesting things, um, and I love that we're potentially subversive, it's something we have to work toward. Um, <laughs> one of the interesting things is that we're, there's a conversation about inequality in America um, today, and that we're all engaged in it in some way, but there's this hidden inequality, um, which is that, you know, as jobs are better paid, they're often steadier. Yeah. And so low pay often is unsteady pay as well, and that part gets lost. And that's where the implications for class, I think, and social um, engagement really are going to matter. Okay. All right. Hi, this is Harold Simon from Shelter Force Magazine. And we do embrace subversion and provoc provocation now also. Um, I'd like to ask about practical implications. This is a great panel, and it's really amazing work that you all are doing, but how does the work that's developed so far affect the kind of financial counseling, financial services we provide to lower income folks? I mean, I think the quick answer, the first answer is that's why we built concurrent sessions around both of these research <laughs> projects later so, because, again, neither one of these have even been released yet, right? You're getting sneak previews in both of these, that the conversation about what the implications are uh, is going to be fielded and designed and developed with, in concert with all of you. Uh, and so, uh, some of those conversations begin right after this in the first concurrent session where there is, uh, I think, that, that the, the financial well-being project will be featured. And then I think there's a Friday session uh, that uh, the Financial Diaries project will be part of as well. I think there's, there's one other thing we can say about it now. Many of you are already doing this, but for all those who are, are working in or think about working in financial education, we have to speak to people's aspirations. It can't be about, I'm telling you what to do, and it can't even be about, if you do this, you're good. People's lives are more complicated. The markets are changing quickly. It really is about skill development. I'll give you a very small example of something we're doing at the Bureau. Our paying for college tools starts with selecting a college, the heart of it is comparing student offers to make sure students know it's a loan, what part is a loan and not a grant, how much it's really gonna cost over 10 years, and goes through how to pay back. When young people, and if they're lucky, their families are doing it with them, go through that exercise with the, with the student loan comparison tool, they're not just helping make a choice about college, they're learning that if you compare your offers, you do better in your financial life. And that's a skill that's going to serve them very well for the rest of their lives. So for all of us, if we're providing one service, we need to think about whether it opens a door for more growth. Yeah. And I'll just put a pitch in for the funders in the room. Um, we tend to think about when we're funding direct service providers, financial counselors, coaches, educators, it's about how many people did you get in, how many people did you get out. Mm -hmm. I think that what we're realizing is that people's financial lives change throughout the life cycle. And what we really need to do is think of ourselves as being trusted advisors and a place where people can go throughout their life cycle. And it has, I think, huge implications for our work. I assume the applause was not for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Will Gerardo with the CDFI Fund. The previous financial diary studies showed that even amongst the very, very poor, there was a a very large amount of financial savings instruments employed, um, mostly in the informal sector, burial societies, um, Christmas clubs. Are you allowed to talk about, are there informal savings mechanisms being used and, and to what degree? It's a great question, um, and one we've been um, thinking a lot about. Yeah, it's really amazing. Um, we see a lot of informal borrowing and a lot of informal saving with groups, especially in immigrant communities. Um, we see the use of rotating savings and credit associations, often people coming together, pooling their resources in order to create a sum that's meaningful and, um, and useful. And we see it um, really across the country in our different, in our different sites. Um, and it's been exciting to see organizations like the Mission Asset Fund them building on some of those informal ideas and seeing how they can come into the formal sector. Right, and I have to say we're, um, we're putting out a series of issue briefs over time looking at specific pieces of data from the diaries, and we have a piece coming out at the end of the month about exactly this issue, so um, watch out for it.
Financialdiaries.org, yeah, right? Thank you, US Financial Diaries. Okay, we have time for one more? Let's sneak in, okay, let's go over here. Hi, thank you so much for uh, letting me ask a question. Mariana Chilton from Philadelphia. I'm an anthropologist and an epidemiologist, and I was very touched that you want to figure out ways to humanize the issues of uh, financial insecurity. Uh, but one thing I haven't heard yet, and I hope that you can address, is the issues of racism and discrimination and of misogyny. In our previous session, we were talking about uh, stereotypes of people who are on welfare um, and how we have to use language to kind of stay away from the language of female-headed households and uh, handling families with wealth on who are on participating in our welfare assistance programs. So how can we address racism and discrimination through these um, personal stories and these, di these financial diaries? And also, is there an opportunity for people who are low income, who are dealing with financial struggles, to be a part of our dialogue and to be present here at this conference and on panels and testifying before Congress? So you, I, I mean, I, I would say for the definition, right, which is the most mm -hmm. well-formed part, Gail, so far, that we were, um, the universality, so we, we did a, there was a focus in the CFPB work on both on working age and on older Americans. There was a lot of ability to, a lot of care in choosing both rural and metropolitan families, in choosing across uh, communities of color and all sorts of different dimensions. The uniformity of the components of financial well-being, regardless of uh, the community from which you come or the class or the income cohort, didn't change. So the good news in terms of that is that this idea of financial well-being as a construct uh, resonates and works uh, regardless. The issues and barriers we talked about about achieving financial well-being, some of those are going to be, you know, things that people are really comfortable about talking on stage, and that might be the area that is still most uncomfortable for folks to kind of figure out. And, and what makes it even more uncomfortable sometimes is actually realizing that you want to have that conversation with the people that are your subjects you know, of research in the room, and I think that that's a place where we're all wanting to go. I know that we'll be talking more about that in the final plenary. There's a huge desire to actually uh, have the voices of the families that we're working with join this work in a much more meaningful way. And by meaningful, I mean ownership stake in the work. And, and we're all thinking about that together. So I don't think we have a lot of answers for that, but I'd say that in some of the starting points, there's some hope. Great, thank you. I'm gonna actually yep. let us get one more in and then this is the final question. Make it good. <laughs> I'll try, thanks for, uh, take, thanks for taking the, the time. Actually, I'm John Hayes from the Mission Asset Fund. Uh, so thanks for the shout out there. Um, I noticed in the presentation uh, that you mentioned very briefly um, having to dip into alternative sources of liquidity and cash flow. Um, and for me, that speaks to access to conventional credit. Are there any takeaways that you have from the study about the participants' access to conventional, normal credit like many of us probably have, as opposed to having to dip into those alternative products? Because I think there's probably more learning that, that I can certainly do about people's families in that space and that the study will really help inform? So we'll, it's a great question. One of the things which has um, been interesting to us is to see how important credit cards are, of course. Um, more than half of our households are actively using credit cards. As Rachel's saying, they're often maxing out, or some of them are maxing out. But the second biggest category after credit cards is borrowing from family and friends, mm -hmm. and much bigger than um, all the other kinds of um, sort of fringe banking and um, alternative credit sources. So it's interesting to see that, that mix and it's something we're gonna be paying attention to as we go forward. Anyone else, anything else to add? Okay. So as our panelists said, this is a preview of work that's in progress. There is much more to come. We hope that we have excited you and interested you and I hope you'll come to some of the follow-up sessions but more importantly, to really, um, we encourage you to look for information as time, we, as we continue to move forward. I wanna thank each of our panelists for coming up here. Great questions, by the way. Thank yourselves, this was really good. Thanks.